we're delighted to start the new session on aortic disease. Uh, my name is Jamal Habbala, and uh, I'll be co-moderating it with uh, Dr. Ali Abu Rahma, and we have our uh, chairpersons with us here. Uh, delighted to start the first uh, presentation with Professor Mahmoud Balas from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Malas needs no introduction. He has uh, had uh, numerous contributions to the vascular surgery field in various publications and leading uh, roles in various societies. Uh, Dr. Malas, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Really glad to be here in Egypt. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I have no financial disclosures. Uh, these are um, essentially the clinical trials that I uh, participated in that related to EVAR. And I'm also the uh, national PI for the uh, thoracic endograph relay for uh, uh, Turumung. So uh, at least in the US, it's a pretty uh, common problem. Uh, 13 leading cause of death and uh, over 15,000 deaths a year. Uh, a lot of pe patients have these aneurysm, and many of them go and diagnose. Um, uh, only vascular surgeon knew who that person is. This is really an early picture of him when he was younger, but he essentially came in uh, with abdominal pain, and there was a surgeon there who was not very famous at that time. His name was Nissen. He tried to wrap his aorta with uh, cellophane paper to slow the growth of the aneurysm. And I'd actually worked for a few years, and then Albert Einstein came back, this is Albert Einstein, came back rupture, and he was offered repair at that time. By that time, the big, he had already replaced aorta with Dacron graft, uh, and uh, Albert Einstein said, I, I want to die elegantly, essentially. It's very different today. In the US, at least, people want to live forever. We operate on people when they're 90 year old and we fix their aneurysms. So uh, Juan Perotti- Recording in progress. Juan Parodi is uh, uh, at least the first person to document an EVAR. And the first time he sent that uh, paper uh, to Journal of Vascular Surgery, it was rejected uh, from the journal. Uh, there is a Russian surgeon also that have done this but did not document it before. Uh, but essentially, uh, Frank Veith, I was really honored to be trained by Frank Veith, and he brought in Juan Parodi uh, from Buenos Aires, and they did the first EVAR uh, in 1992 in the United States. Um, many randomized trials, vascular surgeons know these uh, trials very well. Uh, the first one was the EVAR, which is the BRIDGE trial, uh, that shows essentially twice as many uh, number of deaths postoperatively with open repair compared to endovascular surgery. And, uh, uh, but there were also um, more intervention, re-intervention early on with EVAR compared to open. And then uh, this was followed by the uh, Dutch trial, DREAM trial, that actually showed a similar outcome, a lot more death with open versus endo. It was not statistically significant, but there was a lot more intervention at the cost of more inter re-intervention with endovascular repair. Um, we actually were tasked to kind of interpret the results of OVER. OVER was the biggest randomized trial in the United States comparing open to endovascular repair. And OVER actually had similar uh, mortal you know, mortality difference. So there were a lot more mortality in the open versus endo. But uh, with the OVER trial, they included hernia repair as part of re-intervention with open. And once they included hernia, incisional hernia repair, there was no difference in the re-intervention rate between open and endo. So that was the first randomized trial that kind of showed no difference in re-intervention. Um, we went out to see, okay, well, these are randomized trials, right? You pick the patient very carefully. They have to be perfect. So the outcome might not be a real world outcome. So we went in and used the uh, American College of Surgery NISQIP data. We published this in JAMA. And we looked at the um, about 20,000 patients who had an, a repair. One quarter of them had open repair and the rest got endovascular repair. And every year of the study, as you can see, the open repair has higher mortality, post-operative mortality, that is. Uh, the mortality rate was 1.3% for EVAR compared to over, it was only less than half percent. So that was not really real. It was very, very low number. The one, one and a half percent is more real. Uh, and the open repair have similar. So really these, uh, these numbers also apply in real world data. Um, and essentially you see here that there's 70% reduction in mortality for EVAR compared to open. We also essentially looked at uh, our own experience when I, I was at Hopkins for 14 years. 
We used the Giles, uh, Christine Giles created that model to predict mortality based on what really happening in real world in the United States from Medicare data. And we used this model, applied it to a 500 aneurysm we did. And our predicted mortality should have been 20%, but the actual mortality was 2%. And it's not because we're great surgeons, it's because we have a great institution, great anesthesiologist, great nephrologist, vascular medicine specialist. So we attributed this that the rescue phenomenon, essentially. Our complication rate was not less, but the identification of the complication was faster, and rescuing the patient was better, and this is why our mortality was a lot less than what we predicted. Um, from that moment, there was many random, many trials that actually led to the approval of many devices. I was participating in this uh, device, the Pythagoras, and has really great outcome. This is designed for a very angulated neck, 90 degree angle neck. The Ovation device, also we published recently, the five years outcome. And this device can work even in a six millimeter neck. So we are pushing the envelope on the indication for endovascular repair. Uh, then, along that time, that we start seeing a lot of the long-term outcome. So the, the first trial, the OVER trial, actually published their 10 years outcome. Uh, and you can see here uh, that th there was a still no difference in the mortality between open and endo at 10 years. Uh, you see this in the curve model in the Kaplan-Meier. And uh, there's a systematic review here of many studies that also looked at open versus endo, and you see here the uh, re-intervention rate is a lot higher with endovascular repair. And you see that favoring in the bottom. And also you see that the mortality has no difference at 10 years. The rupture rate, however, was much higher after EVAR compared to endovascular, up to 10 years of follow-up. So we went out, again, finally, this is kind of the final piece that I want to show you. We actually did this study. This is very recent. It recently got published in JAMA. And we looked at long-term outcome on open versus endo. We used the vascular quality initiative, which now have more than 1,000 institutions in the United States that participate. The problem with VQI is the patient don't, don't show up for follow-up, or at least we don't enter the data. So the long-term follow-up is very poor. So what we did to overcome this problem, we linked the social security, every person in the United States have a number, identifier, we linked it to Medicare, and for you know, people who are not from the US, they don't know what Medicare is, but this is the mean that the United States paid for all coverage for insurance for the elderly, which is almost 90% of all vascular patients we take care of are over the age of 65 when they have aneurysm, and they have Medicare. So uh, and nothing happened in the US if you don't pay money, just like anywhere else in the world. So you can get the follow-up very accurately. So we linked the social security between VQI and Medicare, and we are able now to get very good follow-up. And so I, you know. One, one minute left, Mahmoud. We presented, no problem. We presented, we looked essentially at six years, and you know, the two groups were very different, right? People getting EVAR older, sicker. We did propensity score matching. And you see on the right side, they became very nicely matched group. And essentially, we found that, again, for the first time, we're able to show that mortality rate is actually higher with EVAR long term compared to open. So this is different than any of the prior study that is published. And the rupture rate, similar to prior study, is higher. And uh, the re-intervention rate is higher. Postoperatively, again, it's always higher mortality for EVAR. But long term, it sounds like we are losing the benefit, and we're losing it around two years. So in conclusion, um, you know, every study that you can look out there is going to show you that there is less operative mortality with open versus endo. There's no question about it. It's minimally invasive. There's a lot less complication. But it seems like that benefit is last around two years of follow-up, where the, uh, the long-term mortality becomes higher for EVAR compared to open. And essentially, there's a lot more re-intervention. So I really urge you to follow these patients very carefully because they might have a lot more complication with endo, identify problem and fix it. And also pick patient right. If they can have, handle open repair, do an open repair. Don't do people with bad anatomy for EVAR. Do them open, it's a better outcome. Thank you. Th thank you, Professor Malas. Our next speaker is Professor Ashraf Mansour, again from United States, who will address to us ruptures after EVAR. Ashraf. Thank you, Dr. Abu Rahman. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very nice conference. And uh, I'm going to pick up where Dr. Malas uh, left off in terms of 
what happens after you do an endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. I don't have any disclosures in, in this uh, discussion. The biggest problem with endovascular aortic repair is that approximately 1% of patients will come back with a rupture at some point in the follow-up. The CAT scan on the left shows a patient uh, with a ruptured aneurysm with a large uh, retroperitoneal hematoma. <clears throat> so the first question we ask is, what are the predisposing factors for somebody to rupture after an EBAR? We know that a very large abdominal aortic aneurysm greater than eight centimeters. We know that elderly patients, usually because they have tortuous arteries, we know that if you have a type one or type three endoleak, that's a predisposing factor. And then also the most important thing is graft migration. So in follow-up, you not only need to look at the size of the sac, but just the position of the endograft that you put in. Also, we know that the older prototypes for endovascular repair, such as the anurex, are more prone to migration. So the facts are that ruptured aortic aneurysms occur after uh, EVAR. We know that the incidence is there. We know that the only way to detect it is by following patients closely. And then what I'll cover in a couple minutes is how do we treat this? So the benefit of EVAR is that, as Dr. Mullis has showed you, is that initially the benefit is that the mortality rate from the repair is lower. However, in the long-term follow-up, the incidence of rupture and intervention is, in my view, sometimes unacceptably high. And this is a graph from the European Journal of Surgery a few years ago, but it shows that in the beginning, 1994 and 1995, there are almost zero ruptures from EVAR. But as more and more surgeons do EVAR, the number of ruptures are increasing in the literature and the reports about them the same. And as you can tell here, <clears throat> the num and this is just like 10 years ago, but what happens is that in the United States, over 80% of patients end up with an endovascular graft. So the, can we predict this? Is, it, is there a way to look at our patients and say, this patient is more likely to rupture? Well, obviously, what Dr. Malas pointed to is the fact that if you have a, a difficult neck or a hostile neck, that is probably one of the most important predisposing factors. We know also that the ruptures after endovascular repair tend to occur in the first two to four years after repair. When we look at the causes of rupture, the most common thing is that an endoleak is detected or a migration of the graft is seen. Sometimes the grafts, especially the old prototypes, will disconnect at the junction. And in some patients, either the iliac artery or the proximal neck would dilate and that also causes failure. Uh, so when you look at all the patients that are reported about uh, rupture after endovascular repair, you can see that every type of endoleak is implicated, but the most common types are type 1A and type 1B, obviously. Uh, that's proximal and distal. <clears throat> uh, the type 1 is the highest risk, as you can see from this graph. So in, the, in one of the reports that was uh, uh, published a few years ago, it looked at patients that had an EVAR and the behavior of the proximal neck. And what we've seen is that the proximal neck has a tendency to dilate. And this, I think, has been an issue with us uh, selecting the endovascular graft for patients trying to oversize by 20% to compensate for this. Well, <clears throat> late rupture uh, can happen, and this is a systematic review from the literature, and it shows that uh, that the majority of the ruptures can be, in fact, treated with another endovascular repair. And this is a, just a list of all the available grafts that have been talked about. And you can see at the top that the anurex, which is no longer available in the United States, is one of the most common uh, grafts to uh, cause rupture in patients. In this study that uh, came from uh, Britain, uh, they followed 848 patients in their series, and they had uh, 27 patients come in with a rupture in the average follow-up of about five years. And about half the patients had an open repair and they let 15 patients expire. So when you look at uh, the causes of rupture uh, or what is an indication, what is a, a sign that you can see in the patient and follow-up that might 
tell you that this patient is at high risk for potentially rupturing. Well, sac growth is the first thing, endoleak, uh, type one endoleak and type two endoleaks are the, probably the two uh, other factors that you need to look at. So when you took at all the patients that had EVAR, roughly 80% remained stable and about 15 to 20% will come back for a re-intervention. And as I mentioned, about 1% will rupture. So what do you do when they rupture? Well, we looked at our series. The, this has been updated and we're now up to 24 patients who've uh, presented with rupture after uh, endovascular repair. You see that there were 14 patients, but 16 ruptures because two of the patients came back twice with a rupture, once on the right side and once on the left side. And you can see here, these are the types of endoleaks that we detected in these patients. And um, type one and type two are, um, uh, type two actually is, is quite uh, small. The sm numbers are quite small. So how did we fix them? In 14 patients, we were able to do a redo EVAR and two of those patients ended up uh, dying in follow-up. In one patient, we did a thrombectomy and ephemeral femoral bypass, and one patient was allowed to die. So the outcomes, we had 90% of the patients had another endovascular repair, but the mortality from rupture after EVAR is not zero, as you can see here. One of, the one of five patients will end up dying from a complication. And in fact, when you look at the large series, this was a, one of the largest series in the literature reported from the Cleveland Clinic uh, over a long period of time. They had over 100 cases. And you can see here, these are the types of endoleaks that uh, occur. And uh, the uh, infection is obviously another thing that we will uh, talk about at some point in this uh, uh, conference. But the mortality is fairly significant. At 30 days, 17% of the patients will end up dying. And uh, Professor uh, Mansour, less than one minute. Yes, sir. Summary. The, uh, so to summarize, the rupture after EVAR is a recognized problem. The best option is to do another EVAR uh, because the explantation is an operation that is, uh, is quite difficult and complicated. The prognosis of these patients is a little bit uh, worse than patients who uh, present for elective surgery but similar to patients who present with a rupture in the first time. The key is close surveillance is mandatory and that surgeons should be aware of the type of endoleak that puts the patient at risk of rupture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, can I introduce uh, Dr. Samir Kusaya, dealing with hostile neck during EVAR, the ceiling zone challenges. Dr. Samir. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak about uh, ceiling zone challenging during uh, EVAR. We know that fixation is very important in the EVAR and could be a life saving. Uh, to get a good fixation, we need to stick to the eye view. So we need to have a length at least 10 to 15 millimeters and angulation should be less than 60 degree. This is a very nice meta-analysis of seven major study in EVAR by Antonio. He compared hostile versus friendly neck anatomy. And he found that if you have a hostile neck anatomy at the neck, this will increase your type one endolic about 4.5 times and increase your aneurysm rated mortality about nine times. And another study done by Spatial, he looked at the influence of multiple hostile neck parameters. And he found that if you stuck to the eye view, your interoperative endolic could be less than 1%. But if you have two hostile neck parameters, this will increase to 6.7%. And if you have more than two, then you, this would increase to 16.7%. So what he concluded that if you have more than one hostile neck parameter, this substantially will increase your mortality, major adverse event, interruptive endolic, and adjuvant procedures. So I view is very important, but so does the neck quality. Look at the first picture at the, up, at the top. This is, it looks a very friendly neck anatomy. And we know that EVAR will work very well, even while this patient is out of IFU because the angulation more than 60. When we look at the lower picture, this patient has a hostile neck because he has a reverse table. But if you look at the uh, IFU, he's with an IFU. And we know this patient will have some issue down the road. So the binary IFU system, it's important, but may not be the best method to assess the suitability of the EVAR. 
the reason why I'm going to speak about short neck. If you have a short neck less than 10 millimeter, what option? Our first option to get a more proximal uh, sealing zone by doing chimney or fever, or you create an endovascular suture line by doing endo anchors or open repair. But not all short necks the same. We have to differentiate between the neck length and the sealing zone. The neck length is defined by the core lab. It's the length over which the neck diameter remain within the 10% of infrarenal diameter. And look here in the green area. So the first picture is a green one. It has a long neck. Where the other two, they have a short neck. But if we just look at the neck diameter, we may call short neck two different things. Why is that? Because the ceiling zone is different. What the ceiling zone? The ceiling zone defined as the length over which the corrected correctly pair eye view, oversized stand is still circumferentially opposed against the aortic wall. So the craft still touching the wall. We're not getting 10, 15% oversized, but the stand still touching the wall of the neck. And we can see it here in the yellow area. So in the first one here, you can see patient has an adequate neck because it has a long neck and long ceiling zone. Where here, this two has a short neck, but the different, this one here has a long ceiling zone. So the graph expected to oppose circumferentially in hostile ceiling zone, where here we have a short ceiling zone. So the graph will expect to have limit or not even circumferential opposition with the wall of the aorta. Why is that important? Because it's completely different. When you have a patient with a long ceiling zone, a long neck, then we have an adequate neck, so we get a good seal. If you have a short neck, a long ceiling zone, we get a seal, but the seal is very weak, so we have to do something else. Whether this one, we have a short neck and short ceiling zone, we don't have an adequate neck, then we have to get more ceiling by doing something else. Give you an example, like this patient, he has a neck which is 20 millimeters length, which is very good, and ceiling zone 25. So this patient has an adequate neck, so we just have to do a straight EVAR. Where this patient has a short neck four millimeter, but look at the ceiling 10 millimeters. So this one, he will EVAR will give us a seal, but seal is very weak. So we need to strengthen our ceiling by doing a, an endo anchors. How does the endo anchors work? It's create the stability of the surgical anastomosis by providing a transmural fixation of the endograft to the aortic wall. And you can see here, it, it gives us a very strong longitudinal fixation and give us also a radial fixation which prevent separation of the graft during dilatation of the aortic neck. What about this third patient? This patient has a short neck three millimeter, but also ceiling zone three, five millimeter. So this one, EVAR will not work. We need to get a new ceiling zone. So we need to get 15 millimeter ceiling zone. So what option we have? We can go with a shiver or you can go with a PVAR. How we decide, of course, fever is a custom made. It's more considered technology, but the disadvantages need more accurate planning. It takes a time, it's more expensive. Well, shivers off the shelf is good for emergency, technically easier, but the problem is the gutter leaks and the graft conflict, especially if you have a narrow aorta. And if you do, if you decide to do a shiver to get a good ax, uh, outcome, you have to stick to two rules. First, you need at least two millimeter minimum inferior aortic neck, and the new uh, ceiling zone should be at least 10, 15, 10, 15 to 20 millimeters. So if you use one chimney, this the new landing uh, ceiling zone should be measured from the proximal triple A to the highest renal. If you do two chimney, this will be measured from proximal aspect of triple A to the SMA. Of course, you need to oversize also 30% when you do a shiver. So in summary, if you have an adequate neck, then EVAR will work perfect. If you have a hoshsan neck, which that means short neck but long ceiling zone, then you can do an ESR, which is an endo anchors. If you have a short neck with a short ceiling zone, then you need to get more length as I'm doing GVAR or VVAR. So conclusion, host side neck is among, amongst the common cause for reintervention after EVAR, but in experience center, AAA with a host side neck are manageable with convention EVAR, but you need to do with additional tools like chimney, endo anchors, VVAR or FEVAR. But you have to understand the ceiling zone to pick up your right tools. And if you have more unfavorable anatomy, always watch out. And don't forget that open repair is always an option, especially in young patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zain. Next speaker, uh, Professor Fadi Haddad.